It's last year. Last week. Uh, last week's New Year's, and we kind of welcomed in the New Year with a call to be bold, to refuse to let fear control us, to, to, to refuse to let fear uh, keep us from just following God's lead and going wherever He might lead us, to, to resolve to trust Him because we know that He is stronger than whatever it is that we might fear. And we tend to fear a lot of stuff. Uh, we looked at this proverb right here. The wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. And the, the, uh, the godly here are those who put their trust in God, who, who know that God is stronger than their fears, and so they are able to, to follow His lead and go boldly. Uh, they're, they're smart enough... now. When it says they're bold as lions, it doesn't mean that the godly are stupid or foolish or, you know, it just means, I mean, godly people realize there are some things to be afraid of. You know, you, you see a snake on the ground, you step away, you're smart, okay, there's things that you need to, avo need to avoid, but yet the godly don't allow fear to control them. The godly are, are not fearful. They're not filled with fear where they are controlled by it. On the other hand, those who are wicked in the Proverbs are those who do not put their trust in God, who put their trust in themselves or other people or their money or their government or whatever it is they might not be that they put their trust in. And when you put your trust in those things, you are fearful. Now, you might mask it with a you know, macho, even arrogant uh, a personality kind of thing, put on a show, but that fear is there. And that fear is controlling, and that fear is debilitating, and that fear is, is limiting uh, to all of us. Um, people who allow fear to control their lives are afraid of failure, afraid of being weak, afraid of not having enough, afraid of what they have being taken away from them, afraid of things that haven't happened yet, even afraid of things that don't exist, as this proverb says, running away even when nothing is chasing them. When our trust is not in God, we run. This, this whole picture of um, running scared remind me of, uh, of one of my favorite football players of all time, uh, NFL player Jerry Rice, former NFL player Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice was almost without argument the greatest wide receiver that there, there ever was. He played for 20 years in the NFL almost and uh, was just, just phenomenal, set every record that there is basically. I'm going to show you, show you just a tiny snippet of Jerry Rice's Hall of Fame speech, okay? I wasn't the most physical or the fastest receiver in the NFL, but they never clocked me on the way to the end zone. The reason nobody caught me from behind is because I ran scared. That old fear of failure again. It's hard to go into every game with a red X on your chest, and I could feel the hair rise on the back of my neck when people chased me. People are always surprised how insecure I was. I love it when some commentary would refer to an upstart receiver as the next Jerry Rice. That made me work even harder. Jerry Rice will talk about uh, quite a bit how his, his great motivation in, in doing what he did was that he was afraid of failure. Just to Afraid of failure, afraid of the guy, next guy coming after him who would take his spot. Um, and, you know, I, I tell you, I admire people like, like him who have accomplished, uh, you know, amazing things like him, even if it's something, I mean, in the big picture, fairly frivolous, like being good at a football game. Um, but I just admire that kind of a achievement. At the same time, I feel sorry for them. Because, you see, the problem is, is that... When you are driven by a fear of failure, the fear doesn't go away when you succeed. It doesn't go away when you succeed because you succeed, but then you've got to succeed again, and you've got to do it again, and you've got to do it again. You've got to do it again. Otherwise, it all just caves in on you. It doesn't go away. Who wants to live a life filled with fear? Who wants to die being afraid? So many of us live with, with that kind of fear. There is one kind of fear that I'd like us to, to focus on this morning, and this is a fear that I figure all of us deal with in different ways uh, and pretty strongly. 
when I, when I think of this particular fear, I, I think back to when I was 20 years old. And I was 20 years old, college student, and Mike Reeves uh, used to be a youth minister at the West Side Church, Church of Christ. And he had kind of mentored me as a, as a high school student, early college student. He'd, he'd kind of been there a lot in, in, in my life and encouraged me a lot, and, you know, taught me a lot. And he asked me, he was in charge of Christ Teens at the time, and Christ Teens was this youth rally, still is, about 1,500 young people and adults involved. You know, it, was, it, was a, it was a big deal then, it's a big deal now. Uh, and, and he asked me to, to speak, to be a, fill a speaking slot in that, with the, with the whole, whole group, be a keynote at Christ Teens. Now, that was way above my ability range, okay? He didn't, he didn't ask me to do that because I was so talented. You know that already. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't ask me you know, because I was such a great speaker, but, but he knew my talent, my, my, not my talent, he knew my passion. He knew what I cared about, and he trusted me. And so, so here I was, you know, 20 years old, and, and was about to speak in front of this huge group of people. I remember preparing for it. I remember how anxious I felt and how just, you know, just, boy, as you can imagine, almost any of us would, would kind of have some anxiety there. But, but I was like, okay, where does this anxiety come from? And it came from my concern with what other people were going to think about me. Will, will, I, will I perform well? Will, will people be uh, happy with me? Will they be impressed? Will, 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 they, you know, will they think highly of me? And it was this whole thing of what other people are going to think. And I knew, I knew that that's just, that's just wrong. I mean, that's not the reason you, you give a, a lesson is not to, to impress people, to, you know, to, you know, for people to think highly of you. That's just the wrong motivation. So I just battled that. I remember that just interior battle against that that. Fear, what, what the Bible calls the fear of people, the fear of man, the, the concern with what other people think about me. And I continued to battle that on past that experience. I continue to battle it today. Some, sometimes when I think I'm, you know, I don't, I don't worry anymore about what other people think, somehow or another something happens and it kind of rears its ugly head and I realize I still care too much about what people think about me. And in conversations with a lot of you, I've learned that I'm not alone, that that's not an isolated issue, that's not just a, an unusual thing. And, and it seems like, it may seem like not that big of a deal. I mean, it's not the kind of thing as like, you know, murder or adultery or something like that. But that, that fear of people, that concern, that obsession with what other people think about me is so very destructive in our lives and can absolutely ruin what God wants to do in us. So before we kind of get into the details of what it means and what the results of, of, of fearing people, uh, there is actually, on the front end, just, just tell you, there are actually healthy ways to care about what people think about you. It is God-given for us to desire to please others. For instance, it is good for a child to want to please their parents. It is good for a husband to want to please his wife, for a wife to want to please her husband. Uh, it is good for an employee to want to please their boss. You know, pleasing someone else in the right proportion, in the right direction, is, is a good thing, is a godly thing. But as with practically every sin, where it turns bad is when my concern with what other people think becomes about me and me feeling good about myself based on what other people think. Well, I mean, think about this. A follower of Jesus cares what other people think about him or her. Okay? If you're following Jesus, if you're following Jesus, you probably pray, pray some kind of prayer like this often. God, please help them see Jesus in me. God, when, they, when I interact with them through what I say and through what I do and through what we talk about, God, help me to reveal you to them because I want them to see you in me. I, I care about what they think about me because I want them to see you, God. That's, that's, a, that's a godly, that's a good concern. But where it twists is where I care about what you think about me 
because I feel better about myself if other people think highly of me. It becomes about my glory. It becomes about me having it for myself. Whereas a godly care is about wanting to help other people and for God to be glorified. Wanting other people to know God and to see God living in you. But it becomes easily twisted. Uh, when it becomes about my temporary good and my temporary glory, then my concern about what other people think turns bad. Uh, the fear of people is not just about caring about what other people think about me. The fear of people can also take a much more literal uh, form. I become afraid of losing something. I become afraid of people taking something from me. I'm afraid someone will, will take my, my friendships, take my, my group of friends or my friend. I become afraid that somebody's going to take my position that I have. Afraid that somebody's going to take my job. Afraid that, that my, my looks are going to erode, which they will. Um, you know, I become afraid of, of, uh, that my money is going to be drain, drained away. Even afraid that someone might physically hurt me. A lot of us live a lot with, with fear of our, our uh, physical security. I, I once had a, had a guy uh, tell me, he was talking about another guy, and he said, man, that guy is not afraid of anything. I mean, he packs heat everywhere he goes. He sits in, his, in front of his TV in his house in his living room in his underwear with his pistol strapped to him. I mean, he, he ain't afraid of nothing. And what was going through my head was, sounds like to me he's very afraid. I mean, that seems, that seems pretty fearful to me. You know, uh, i, I got to have that, that, that gun with me even when I'm watching TV in my underwear. You know, man, um, we, we become afraid of of other people, of other governments, of other races, of terrorists, of all kinds of, all kinds of others. And, and certainly there are reasons for us to have, to have concerns. But as the writer of this next proverb is going to tell us, to live in fear, the fear of people, to be afraid of people, to be afraid of what they think and what they might do to us, is a no-win situation. I, I, I hope we can memorize this, uh, this proverb right here. It's easy to memorize. Here's what it is. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but <coughs> trusting the Lord means safety. Will you, will you say that out loud with me, okay? Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. One more time out loud. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Nobody wants to be in a trap, right? Falling into a trap means that you have, you have become limited. You have become bound. You've become confined. Uh, your freedom is taken away. You cannot any longer do and go as, as you please. To be in a trap means that somebody else controls you. Somebody else has a hold of you. Somebody else decides your fate, decides where you will go. An animal in a trap is going to have a bad end, okay? The ending is not going to be pleasant, all right? An animal that is caught in a trap is either going to die in that trap or whoever set that trap is going to kill them or do whatever it is that they do, do with them. It's not desirable for that animal when you are trapped, there is an undesirable end. It does not lead to a good place. It does not need, lead to a good setting. Being trapped is miserable, and it ends even worse. Fearing people, being concerned about what people think about you and what they might do to you, traps you. It traps you. It, it holds you. It confines you and takes away your freedom. It takes away the control of your life and puts it in somebody else's hands. And it guarantees that who you are at the end of your life and where you end up will be undesirable. Fearing people is a trap. And at least at some level, you have experienced this already. Uh, you know that as you concern yourself with what other people think about you, what other people might do to you, uh, it eats at you. 
when people slight you, when people ignore you, when people leave you out, when people make fun of you, when people talk about you, when people undermine you, when people are against you, when people physically hurt you, your entire life can be choked out because of what somebody else did, because of what somebody else is doing, because of what somebody else said, because of what somebody else is doing. Your entire life and what God has planned for you and the plan God wants to work out through your life can be completely derailed because of what somebody else is doing. And you're left paralyzed, simmering in anger and frustration and pain because of what someone else thinks or what someone else has done. You've experienced that at some level or another. another maybe right now you're in the middle of it. Because we can spend days, we can spend weeks, months, we can spend years in frustration and anger because of what somebody else is doing. Because that's what the fear of people, that's what the concern about what other people say and do does to us. It traps us and it chokes the life out of us. So, if you're trapped, wrapped up in frustration and anger, if you're fearful about what people think about and do towards you, here's the warning, okay? You're in danger. You're in a trap. And if you don't if you aren't freed from that trap, it'll be miserable and the ending will be undesirable. Fortunately, there's a way out of the trap. There is a way out of the trap. There is a way to safety. We don't have to live in the fear of people. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be anxious about what other people think, what other people might do. We don't have to be controlled by them. We can experience freedom. And here's the deal. The solution to the fear of people, the way of safety, the way out of the trap, is way too simple. It's way too simple, but it's also really difficult because it goes against our, our selfish nature and it goes against our culture because our culture is driven by our selfish nature. And it sounds religious, it sounds overly simplistic, and it sounds easy to dismiss, but if you take this seriously, if you devote your life to this, it changes everything. The way to safety is to put your trust, put your trust in God, to believe in Him, to trust in who He is, and to trust that what He says about you is the truth. That what he says about you is the truth, and to trust him in that. Here's why, here's why this seems so difficult, okay? Um, I'm going to try to explain, explain this, and, and I'll, I will do this imperfectly, okay? You and I grow up, everybody grows up from, from childhood. We originally get our sense of identity, our, our sense of who we are, from the people around us, from our parents, from our, our friends, from our coaches, from our teachers, people that, who say, hey, hey you're, you're good at this, you do well at this, or who say, man, you stick at this, or you're no, you're no good at this. And, you're, and we, we get our sense of identity based on what other people around us think about us, as well as what we're able to do, our natural abilities, our, our, our hard work, our accomplishments, our performance, and we, we build up our self-identity based on others' opinions of us and our own accomplishments. Now, that's natural. That's normal. All of us from, from childhood do that. But that is childhood. We were not meant, we were not intended to continue to base our identity off of other people's opinions of us or our own abilities. The adult way is this. You are who God says 
you are. See, he's the one who dreamed you up. He's the one who dreamed you up. He's the one who created you. He's the one who, who, who took you and knit you together and is, it is sustaining your life. He's the one who is with you. He is the one who knows you. He is the one who has plans for you. And who he says you are is who you are. And it doesn't matter what mama says. It doesn't matter what daddy says. It doesn't matter what coach says. It doesn't matter what people around me say. You are not who they say you are. You are who he says you are. And you are not the sum of your accomplishments. Your identity is not wrapped up in your ability in what you can do and what you accomplish and how you perform and what you achieve. You see, if our, if our sense of identity rests on the opinions of others and our own accomplishments, that is a very, very unstable foundation. It's a fearful foundation. It can't be sustained. We, and if, if my identity is based on what I can accomplish and how well I do, then I must keep on performing. I must keep on accomplishing. I've got to achieve. I've got to achieve. And when I make it, I've got to achieve again because success doesn't take the fear away. I've got to repeatedly succeed and succeed in order to keep that fear sort of at bay, in order to, to feel okay about myself, to be all right. And that is a fearful it's unstable, it's a miserable, it's a trap of a place to live and a way to live. My parents don't have the right, my teachers don't have the right, my friends don't have the right to tell me who I am. In fact, the best thing we as parents can do, the best thing we as parents can do can teach our kids, can show our kids what God thinks about them, how God values them, what God is doing for them based on how much He values them, and for, to help them find their value in Him, and not what we think, and not what the people around them think, and not how well they perform. Right, to, try to, to try to help rescue them from that trap of, of fearing people that all of us fallen into so deeply. When we let God tell us who we are, and we trust that what He says is true, we are freed from the fear of people. So, who does God say you are? Who does God say you are? Now, if you are, if you are not a child of God, if you haven't placed your, your faith in Him, I want you to know that you are a loved creation of God, made in His very image, made in a way that He wants to adopt you into His family, and He wants to give you life. If you are a child of God, if you have put your faith in Him, if you are trying to follow Jesus, I'm just going to read this scripture right here. And uh, if, if, you, if you've got, if you want to get out of the Bible and read this, I mean, this is an NLT, you can read along with this. I'm not going to show it on the screen, but just listen to this, because this is a little more direct than what I could do. This is the Apostle Paul talking to a group of Christians about who they are in Christ. Paul says this, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace He has poured out on us who belong to His dear Son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom. He purchased our, our freedom with His blood and forgave our sins. He has showered His kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us His mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill His own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, 
He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. And furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. He chose us in advance, and He makes everything work out according to His plan. God's purpose was that we Jews, He's talking about Himself, He, well, he was a Jew, but we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, most of us, have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, when you believed in Christ, He identified you as His own by giving you His Holy Spirit, whom He promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify Him. And Paul prays this prayer for these Christians and for us by extension. Ever since I first heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope He has given to those He called, His holy people who are His rich and glorious inheritance. And I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Oh,
God has told you who you are. And now your job, my job, is to believe it. That's a formidable job. It's not just something you decide once and then it's taken care of. It's work. One one time, some people came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, what must we do to do the work God requires? How would you answer that? What must we do to do the work God requires? Here's what Jesus answered. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. The work of God is this, to believe in me, to trust in me, to put your daily trust, your everyday trust in me. You believe in who I am and that you believe what I tell you. You believe who I say you are. And when you believe who he says you are, it changes everything. Who has the right to tell you who you are? Only one. So let's do the work of believing him. Let's believe him about what he says who we are. Let's go and do the work of God and put our trust in him. Let's pray.